Hi, we're the Bratz family. I'm Lizzie Bratz. I'm 10 years old. And I'm Jolene Bratz. And this is our dog, Matt. We've been members for about five and a half years. And I've helped out with study school for about three. And I'm a member of the education ministry. My favorite part about Hope is vacation Bible school. And we hope to meet new families when we all come back together. And pray that everyone stays safe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have the opportunity to speak responsively words from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Then he will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust, and has not turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done, and your thoughts toward us. There is none to compare with you. 
I would declare and speak of them. They would be too numerous to count. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. His righteous government and love shall over all extend on judgment and on justice based. His grace shall have no end. His grace shall have no end. Lord Jesus, reign in us, we pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for today comes to us from 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. It happened at that time, as Eli was lying down in his place, now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see well, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, that the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So Samuel, uh, so he went and lay down. The Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. St. Paul writes, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? 
Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd invite you to stand, please, for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And the next day, he, Jesus, purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, That I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever served in a particular calling or worked a particular job that required you to see things in a way that is different than others might see them? I bet there's a good chance you probably have. If God has called you, for example, to be a mom or a dad, he has also called you to see your children in a way that others do not see them, to pick up on their subtle cues, to understand what a particular facial expression means, to know a particular tone of voice and what it communicates, that something is going on inside your child's heart. If God has called you to be a farmer or a gardener, someone who works with nature and with plant life, you've probably developed the ability to see things that the rest of us naturally don't see. Little signs in the plants themselves or in the soil to indicate whether a plant might be healthy or sick, uh, whether it will yield abundantly or sparingly this year. If God has called you to work with vehicles, you can probably look into an engine block and see potential issues much more clearly than the average Joe, including people like your pastor. God has called you into a healthcare profession. It's likely that you can look at a person, view their movement, observe their symptoms, and come to some conclusions about that person's well-being that the average Joe might not immediately recognize. With so many professions and callings, we become more skilled and useful as we learn to see the world from a particular lens, as we learn to pay attention to information that others might naturally dismiss. So what might it look like to see the world as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus? Are we, who have been baptized into Christ, supposed to see things differently than those who do not know him? Well, if you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, you would answer, yes. But what does it mean? What does it really look like to see the world with the vision of a Christian? Today, our gospel reading from John chapter 1 helps us to do just that. It's the account of Jesus calling some of his first disciples, men who are being invited not just to follow Jesus, but in following him to see everything in a new and different way. Today's reading uh, begins in John 1 verse 43, but I'd actually like us to go backwards a little bit uh, to some of the verses immediately before this one. Uh, there we have John the Baptist speaking with two of his followers, two of his disciples. As he's speaking to them, they see Jesus passing by. John points him out and says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And here, the theme of seeing things differently has already taken hold. For what we know from other places, it seems that Jesus is a pretty ordinary-looking guy. In fact, that's even prophesied about him in Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, we hear that Jesus has no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should be drawn to him. In other places of the Gospels, it seems like that bears out. For example, when Jesus uh, preaches in his hometown of Nazareth and he preaches with power and authority, the people are surprised. They didn't see it coming. They think he's an ordinary guy, just like one of them. And yet John, in his interaction with Jesus, has now come to see him differently. 
For in the Jordan River, the heavens had been opened. The Spirit had descended. He had heard the voice of the Father. You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. John now saw Jesus differently. He saw him as he really was, with the new eyes of faith. Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold, the one through whom God will deal with the problem of sin and evil forever. Behold! And behold, they did, those disciples of John. Not only that, but they left John and they started following Jesus. One was Andrew, who in turn went and found his brother, Simon, whom Jesus decided to rename Peter. The next day, we're told that Jesus finds Philip, who happens to be from the same town as Andrew and Peter. Jesus says to him, follow me. And it's clear that in that moment, God has blessed Andrew with the gift of new vision as well, perhaps because of what uh, Andrew and and Peter had said. Consider uh, Philip's description of Jesus as he goes and he seeks out Nathanael. This is what uh, Philip says about Jesus. John 1, verse 45, he says, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Jesus calls Philip. And with the call comes a new way to see. John calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Philip calls him the one who fulfills the writings of the law and the prophets, the one in whom all the promises of God are going to come true. The promises of a Messiah, a Savior King who will rescue his people from their sin. Nathaniel seems intrigued, but highly skeptical. From Nazareth? Really? What comes out of Nazareth? Certainly nothing good. Philip's reply, come and see. Nathanael arises and goes to meet this Jesus. And when he does, contrary to his initial expectations, his entire way of seeing life is also changed forever. Jesus reveals his divine knowledge of Nathanael's character and his whereabouts, and Nathaniel is suddenly convinced. And that belief opens up Nathaniel to see, ultimately, even greater things than that. Jesus said, are you, are you impressed? Do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You're going to see greater things than these. Jesus says, you're going to see the heavens opened, the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In the Old Testament, Jacob had seen a vision like that. Jacob was the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham, been fleeing for his safety from his brother Esau, was out in the wilderness, and one night he saw a vision just like that. The heavens opened, stairway from heaven to earth, and the angels of God ascending and descending. Now Jesus comes along and says to Nathanael that you're going to see such a scene in a whole new way. Instead of a stairway, you see me. For you see, Nathanael, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This Jesus is no ordinary man. He's the way. Everything changes when the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see who Jesus really is. No longer can he exist in our minds simply as an interesting historical figure or as one important voice among many. No longer can we even really just call him an important 
part of our lives. For when we see him as he is, we come to understand that he is the entirety of our life, that he is at the center of everything, that all things hold together in him. Nathaniel began that day intrigued but skeptical. By the end of the day, he saw nothing but Jesus. Nothing mattered anymore except to follow after him. How about you? Have you been trained to see all of life in a new way because of Jesus? There are a few ways in which I believe God trains us to see differently. As Jesus calls us to follow him, he invites us to look past external appearances to see what he's really doing through eyes of faith. Just as he met the first disciples as uh, an ordinary looking man from a very ordinary town, so he comes and meets us in ways that outwardly often seem unspectacular. Think about those things that we Lutherans call the the means of grace, the the vehicles by which God brings his his gifts, his forgiveness, and his love to us, the good news. We splash a little water on a baby's head, and yet the Holy Spirit trains us to see so much more. God joining that child to Jesus in his death and in his resurrection— A washing that forgives the sin that would have separated us from God forever. An act of adoption that gives us a new name and a place in God's own family. Week after week, we hear the good news of what Jesus has done for us, and yet you hear that news over and over again from an unextraordinary person a mid-30s pastor who definitely does not have all of life figured out. Or our kids will hear it from a Sunday school teacher who loves her kids but may not be a public speaker by profession. Or they hear it from a mom or a dad who themselves struggle with patience and distraction. Or we hear that good news from a friend who shares some of the very same weaknesses that we have. And then, having heard that good news, we come forward to see, receive a little piece of bread, a little sip of wine. So ordinary, if it weren't for Jesus' own promise that he's present in the meal, bringing us his forgiveness and strength. We experience weakness, but God invites us to see in it something new an opportunity for him to show his faithful strength. We suffer. And yet in that suffering, God invites us to see in that journey an opportunity to learn to trust him more. We experience death. But God invites us to see even that moment in a different light through the lens of Jesus' own death and resurrection. It's the gateway to eternal life. Not only do we see what God is doing through Jesus with eyes of faith, but then we also come to see the people around us in a different way as well, to begin to see them as Jesus sees them. No longer are they just the abrasive co-worker or the political opponent or the rebellious child. Rather, that person is beloved dearly loved, treasured by God. They struggle with the same problem of sin that we struggle and face, even if their temptation might be a different one than ours is. And they are people for whom Jesus came, for whom he lived and suffered and died. They are fearfully and wonderfully made, and they, like we, are meant to know God's great love for them so that they might trust that love and flourish as members of God's family. We see others differently. Finally, as we follow Jesus and as he sends us out, we come to learn more and more what others are meant to see as they look 
at us. They're meant to see Jesus. And Jesus isn't put on display primarily through beautiful buildings, though those buildings can serve a purpose. Jesus isn't put on display through us because we are fit and beautiful and put together. Rather, people see Jesus in us as we ordinary men and women, boys and girls, live out of a courageous, humble character with self-giving love, empowered by the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. That's what Jesus said. He said, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Come and see. That's what Philip said to Nathaniel. Come and see. That's what God's word says to you and to me today. May God the Holy Spirit continue to work in his church, that more and more we would see Jesus in this epiphany season, and more and more that others would see Jesus through us in his name. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep our hearts and minds today and always in Christ Jesus, through whom we see so much more than expected. Amen. Having heard God's word, we have the opportunity to respond together, confessing the faith, using the words of the Nicene Creed. I'd invite you please to stand as we confess the faith. We speak together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have gathered us. We thank you that you have called us in the water to follow after your Son, Jesus, to know him, to experience his goodness, his truth, his life, to know him as the way to you, Heavenly Father. We pray uh, that you'd grant us grace uh, to follow him each and every day and to display his light in our lives with one another by the way that we love one another. We thank you, Father, that you hear our prayer of thanksgiving on behalf of those who celebrate your good gifts in the form of a birthday. Uh, today we lift up uh, those who celebrate. Uh, we pray for uh, Madeline James. We pray for Erica Vandehei, for Ethan Ebner, for Max Schrader, for Brenda Burkhardt, we pray for Elizabeth Vanden Heuvel and for Emily Thompson Zadnick. Uh, Lord, that you'd grant your grace uh, to these, your servants, as they rejoice in your goodness to them and the, year of, and, and the gift of another year of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray your blessing and healing upon those in need of your presence in their lives as well. Uh, we lift up all those whose lives have been impacted 
uh, by COVID-19. We continue to lift up our sister in Christ, Charlotte, who suffers with the virus and also has other uh, serious medical complications that you'd look with favor upon her and provide for her need, as well as the need of her family. Uh, we pray for all those who struggle uh, with this virus, that you'd grant healing to those who are sick and protection to those who are vulnerable. Be with all those who serve and protect us and, and uh, bless us as healthcare workers as well. Uh, we pray for others in need of healing and strengthening as well. We lift up land and a little son of, of Krista and Ryan Dickey as he continues to grow and develop in the NICU. Uh, Lord, that you'd grant grace to him and, and proper development that he'd be able to come home soon. Uh, we lift up Bill Ackerman. We pray for Nicole Clevisall and Colleen Cummings. We pray for Caleb. Lord, bless Cheryl. Be with Bob. Continue to bless uh, Pastor Paul Pett. We thank you for the healing you have given him. We pray for Nicole Bauman, for Robert Vandenplas, for Bob. We pray for Jack Gillett, for Mark Osen, for Jen. We lift up John and members of Bob Gauze's family. We pray for Randy Becker, for Ella, for Jody, for Becky, Gail, Alan, Megan, and all those who are in need of healing, Father, that you'd grant your grace to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, continue to be the comfort and strength of those who mourn as well. We especially lift up uh, Annalise and her family at the death of her grandmother, that you'd grant your grace to them, comfort and strength, and Lord, draw them closer to yourself, the God of comfort, uh, and that they might experience the hope that is ours each and every day in Jesus. Uh, Lord, we pray your blessing upon all those who uh, struggle because of events in our nation, uh, that you'd grant your grace to us. Deal with us according to your mercy and not according to what we deserve. Uh, where justice needs to happen, we ask that that would happen. Uh, Lord, where reconciliation and healing needs to take place, we ask that that would happen. Uh, Lord, that you would uh, govern us by your grace and by your truth, and that you'd grant us wise and faithful leaders who would fear you and do what is just and right for the good of all. Uh, Lord, be with us and, and protect and watch over us. Uh, we pray for all those who uh, serve for our well-being as uh, members of our armed forces or as police officers, firefighters, uh, those who uh, put themselves in harm's way for our good, that you'd also protect and keep them in their daily callings, to grant them courage and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing upon your church, especially as we make this epiphany journey and the light grows, that it would grow inside of us as well, and that others would experience your light through us, to that end strengthen us, through this gift that we share again today of your Son's true body and blood. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you hear us for Jesus' sake, and we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to your mercy, praying the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.